was doing everything I could therapeutically at the time to get to a better place, but was really looking to a lot of the wellness world and industry to save me, right? Like if I just eat this way, I'll feel better. Or if I take this many saunas, I'll feel better. And truly what really the real answer was, if I heal my trauma, I'll feel better. Gabrielle Bernstein, a role model for spiritual seekers. Let's just begin with my claim to fame. <laughs> my freaking claim to fame is that I was the first ever interview, video and audio, video and written word on Mind Body Green. Wow. So I mean, take that wellness industry. <laughs> I, I will go even further and remind people that this is when you didn't do videos on your phone. So I had a flip cam. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, I wasn't very good at editing. So we had to do it in one take. I would put the camera on and then quickly pivot and we would have to do it in one take. I remember that. I remember the one take. <laughs> or then we'd edit it ourselves in iMovie. Oh, I wouldn't even go that far. I could just, I knew how to edit the beginning and the end. Yeah. Yeah. No, we are really old school. We are really old school. We didn't even have Facebook or Instagram, nothing. We were just telling, telling people on the street in the yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of my favorite. It really is one of my favorite things to get together with you guys or like, we're like the well and good girls or, you know, just to sort of be like, yeah, we've really seen a lot happen. Yeah. Yes. And I, I feel like that's a big part of what I want to talk about today with you is the, th the fact that we kind of have this camaraderie around being at the beginning stages of this zeitgeist of this wellness conversation, spiritual conversation. It's not that it hadn't been happening for decades in terms of spirituality and well-being, but in terms of it becoming democratized and, and, and a broader message. And so therefore, we've been sort of at the forefront of this, this evolution of the conversation. And I see you guys as these major experts in the, in the wellness industry with your fingers to the pulse of what's hot and sexy right now, what's happening next. And I want to hear from you, you know, where, where do you think we're at right now? Like, what, what are the big trends that I, Gabby Bernstein, need to know about for the future? Of the wellness industry so i'll start with with the, this concept of joy which happens to work its way in the title of our book and is a, it is a part of our why and, and my why as it relates to the conversation on longevity you know I, longevity has become a passion of mine and you know since my buddy green started i was in my 30s wasn't really thinking about longevity and fast forward to age 48 and having two little girls it, it's it's at the forefront you know, men have a terrible track record in my family here. My father died of heart disease at 47 and my, my two other grandfathers died, died early, one from heart disease at 49 and the other of cancer at 44. And so where we've seen this conversation advance so much in the 14 plus years is around longevity. This idea of extending lifespan, I would say lifespan's the, the 1.0, you know, we can, let's get you to a hundred. I think modern medicine's been, been good at, uh, you know, once faced with disease, extending life, but who wants to have a long life if your quality of life is really suffering? And so the 2.0 is this idea of health span where you're extending life, absence of disease, you know, you're healthy, you're fit, you're mobile. Um, and I think that that's, that's pretty good. You know, I, I would sign up for that, but we want to take it a step further. And this comes back to where we think the future is, is this idea of joy span. You know, what's the point of living to age a hundred and being fit and mo mobile and healthy if you don't have friends, if you don't have joy? I think that's something that's really important to us. I think, you know, if we look at the mental health epidemic, I think of the loneliness epidemic, uh, one in seven men don't have a single friend. One in 10 women don't have a single friend. Uh, I think it's 30% of, or 25% of those under 30 are, are, are lonely. There's a loneliness epidemic. It, it, it is, it is, there are dire health consequences. Um, there's a great researcher out of BYU who's equated being lonely with the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah. And in, in terms of premature mortality, and it's yeah. twice as bad as having six drinks a day. That's mm. 42 drinks a week. 
three times as bad as being physically inactive and four times as, as bad as four times worse as, as being obese. So if we take a step back and like our why right now and where we think things are going is, look, we've come so far with the science around longevity, but we really need to focus on connection, on spirituality, on purpose, on joy, mm. because the health consequences are dire. And, you know, again, like, let's have, let's have fun. Let's, yeah. let's have great connection. Yeah. You know, I think we have a very complicated relationship with the word wellness and, you know, there's never been more wellness right now, but also by all objective markers and Jason alluded to a lot of them, like we're not really well right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think less than 12% of people responded that they would classify themselves as very happy, which is like the lowest that uh, that study has been in the years in which they've done it. So while we all live in this algorithm in which we see so much wellness, you know, Jason and I look at a lot of the culture right now and we're like, we can't even fit this into our own lives, whether it's, you know, the bro centric optimization protocols and regimens. And then on the other hand, you have, you know, a lot of what we call like Kardashian wellness, where it's a lot of stuff that if you have the resources and the time for it, fantastic. Yep. It's not really amenable to the life stage that we're at. So if we think of wellness, it's a lot of optimization. It's a lot of protocols and regimen. And we intentionally called the book, The Joy of Wellbeing, because we want to shift the conversation, have it be more about the journey, integration, and things that are actually able to be integrated into your life to create more abundance. There's, there's two things I want to say to what you guys said. First of all, amen, beautiful, because you're right. And I can even think back to the times in my life when I wasn't in joy and I was really plagued with unresolved burdens and, and disturbances and <clears throat> was doing everything I could therapeutically at the time to get to a better place, but was really looking to a lot of the wellness world and industry to save me, right? Like if I just eat this way, I'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Or if I take this many saunas, I'll feel better. Or if I'm, you know, and truly what really the real answer was, if I heal my trauma, I'll feel better. <laughs> and so, um, and, 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 you know, m all my gut issues are gone because I've healed the core wound. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, the joy is the ultimate wellness solution. Yes. And look, we, we still don't want to, we still believe that nutrition and exercise are foundational. You need to eat well, you need to move, you need to do some resistance training. You know, we, we believe all of that. However, and I think most people understand if they're not doing that, you know, I know if I'm really not eating, eating as well as I could be having too much sugar or not moving too sedentary. But to your point, I think most people have a little bit more difficulty assessing, you know, how am I doing it on my emotional health right now? Yes. Yes. And thankfully, there's a much, much, much stronger conversation around it, and that the in the same breath, there's far less connection than ever before. And I, I think back to where we were 18 years ago when we first had that interview, and we were just sort of like, you, you know, I was in my 20s, you were 30, and we just, just had this great vision. And I think the biggest vision we both had was cr creating community. And I always kind of joke around that I started giving talks at the Gay, Lesbian, Transgender Center across the street from my 13th Street apartment, I gave these talks and I set up the chairs from Melissa, who's the producer here. She was setting up the chairs with me and I did it because I just wanted friends, you know? I wanted some spiritual friends. And I think that that, that connection piece that you both have brought up here is so important to address because you've built community online, right? And and of course, we had all these opportunities to be in, be in connection to others. But for that those those horrific glaring statistics around the loneliness epidemic what do you guys think and what do you suggest in the book are directions that we can take and actions that we can take to create more connection in such a digital world so we have a couple of thoughts one I, what i want to say that this is an area where just men are flat out terrible you know we're, we're much worse than our female counterparts. We, we lose touch more easily. We tend to, if we're in a relationship, we tend to take on the, the friends of our partner and we're just not good communicators. And this is one personally, I, I've been terrible at, I had a great group of friends, you know, post 
playing basketball at Columbia. We were all in New York. We went out all the time. We probably did a lot of things we shouldn't have done, but we had a great time. And, and that, that community was real. And then come 30s, work, and then marriage, and then kids, it faded, and I'm terrible at staying in touch. However, with all that said, I do think the beauty of technology is that it makes it a lot easier to reach back out. If, you, if we had to go back in time, it'd be a lot more difficult. You'd have to pick mm -hmm. up the phone. You'd have to dial. There'd be that silence. Uh, who is this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now it's a text message. It's a DM. Hey, so-and-so, it's been, it's been quite some time. Been thinking of you because of X, Y, and Z. How are you? Missed hanging out. Let's reconnect. Yeah. I think most people will be pleasantly surprised by the response. And, and you mm -hmm. also understand that appetite for reconnection with the response or lack of response. And so that's one mm -hmm. thing I've incorporated for those who've lost touch that is <clears throat> less anxiety-inducing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we have to be careful not to conflate digital community with IRL community because the experiences have very different impacts on the brain, on our levels of oxytocin. And I find the digital community at times to be somewhat exhausting. You know, you're kind of bombarded. You walk into this room and it's like, oh, wow, there's lots of angry people here. I wasn't anticipating yeah. that. The type of things you wouldn't have and that it almost exhausts you to a point where you don't have the energy and aptitude for an IRL community, but the impact on our brain and our relationships are so different between a digital community and an IRL community. And I found that we have to be intentional about cultivating an IRL community. And we talked a little bit before we started about how we just moved to Miami. And it's one of those narrow windows in time when you make such a, a big life change that we were so intentional about creating community. And I think for many of us, we have to move outside our comfort zones, find groups of people, um, you know, where maybe there's shared interests. A yeah. lot of community for me has evolved among, you know, parents who are at similar life stages mm -hmm. or people share our passions for wellness. And then it's about putting yourselves in those slightly uncomfortable positions of, you know, asking someone out on the first date. Um, I read a recent Wall Street Journal article about how people are treating their IRL kind of friendships, realizing the transformative impact that it can have on their own health and well-being and applying, you know, the same rigor that they would to their business of like, let's have a KPI of meeting, you know, IRL with someone. <laughs> I do think we have to have a certain level of intention about this, because if you just let it you know, be in the same way when you were, you know, in college and you magically on that first freshman year made friends, like, unfortunately, the same thing doesn't happen in the modern world. Yeah, no, you are so right about that. I'm actually an extreme extrovert and my husband's an extreme introvert. So he definitely falls into the category of like the husband that has created great friendships through, through my direction and a bit of my, my son as well. Like sometimes my son will be at the beach and he'll be like, mommy, can we go make friends with that person? You know, cause he knows I'll just like walk over and be like, you, you play with Oliver, <laughs> you know? Um, but, um, but I think that also knowing your personality type. So if you are an introvert, knowing that you may not do that well at a big party, but maybe you meet, you know, that other father at drop off or whatever. And you're like, Hey, do you want to play tennis today? Or do you want to have a coffee or just start chatting directly? Whereas if you're an extrovert, you know, you know, that, that you get filled up in those situations. My, my husband has this great, great sort of <clears throat> philosophy that the introverts, when they, they, they go to a party and they've got five coins and the extrovert has five coins. And when the introvert shows up at the party, they w go home with negative five coins and the, in the extrovert shows up and she, they're like millionaires when they leave, you know, cause we just get so filled up from that connection. So I think that when you talk about connection in, in real life, IRL, it's almost important to first and foremost assess where am I and how do I like to connect and what's a safe way for me to connect. Um, but but to also to your point, Colleen, take connections so seriously because, you know, make, create some KPIs around your connection. Because if we don't, we can easily fall into the trap of just like Netflixing and, you know, Instagram friending and just not actually connecting. And, and on that note, you mentioned the dreaded, you know, show up to a party and, you know, you show up to a party and you don't know anyone what to do. And there's a great tip from Gretchen Rubin I love in this situation where, you, you know, we've all been there. You show up and there's these like buckets of people and they're talking and you're like, I don't know anyone. Where do I go? Well, you go, you show up to a group and you say, hey, everyone, I don't know a single person here, but you guys look like you're really nice and having an awesome conversation. So I'm going to join. Yeah. Well, that's a great piece of advice 
for you, for me, for anyone who even has like the slightest extrovert. But if you said that to my husband, he'd be like, fuck you. <laughs> so, so I think that, you know, one thing I always tell people that are really introverted is ask other people questions about themselves because extroverts just want to talk about themselves all the time. So, you know, just, just go find the person in the room that like seems to want to talk about themselves and just ask them lots of questions and maybe you'll get some cool information about them because introverts just want to have deep and meaningful conversations, right? Extroverts want to touch, talk, everybody and just maximize the conversations. And, um, but yes, I do like that, you know, I, I outing it a bit, right. It's like, I don't yeah. know anyone here what's going on. Um, but again, I do think that would be a very extreme suggestion to an introvert. <laughs> um, now longevity, what else do we need to know about longevity? I'm 43. I met you when I was 28. Like we've, you know, I have a lot more wrinkles and, and, and I want to know what to do. How can I support my longevity? What, what's, what's the plan here, guys? You know, I think in general, we want to shift the conversation to be more about the fundamentals. Um, how do we concentrate more on baking the cake than putting on the actual frosting? And don't get me wrong. We love the frosting. We sleep on an eight sleep. You know, we have elements of our life that are, are high frosting. But What's an eight not- sleep, Colleen? Back it's it up. The, it's one of the cooling mattresses. So oh, yeah, yeah. I have one, too. I have the, got the eight sleep cooling. mattress. I'm wearing a whoop and an aura ring. I just had like 30 vials of blood taken today for Frank Lippman. So like we, we do some of that stuff. But but it is. Well, you better you better drink the, you know, drink the juice and walk your talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> in that way. If you like this video and you want to get more Gabby, check out the next one right over here.